collecting and providing circulating equipment. I'd like to introduce our four panelists today. Adam Beck currently serves as the Equipment Lending Supervisor for Classroom Instructional Technologies, which is a division of the Faculty Center for Teaching and Learning at Missouri State University, where he has been for 17 years. He supervises and manages the daily operations of the Classroom Instructional Technologies Division. He selects, trains, and supervises the part-time and student delivery staff and student secretaries. He trains equipment users and student staff in the proper setup and use of media systems, consults with and advises the media systems technicians on a daily basis, monitors weekly the inventory of high theft risk equipment and annually all equipment, and provides equipment upgrades, installations, emergency repair and troubleshooting in the classroom when problems do arise with the media systems. He is currently finishing up his master's degree in administrative studies at MSU and serves on the board of directors for campus ministry there. He and his wife Becky have two dogs, a one-year-old lab, uh, lab border collie <coughs> named Shelby and a two-year-old lab pit bull named Shadow. He is currently a member of CCUMC and believe it or not, this is his first conference. So thank you, Adam. Adam's personal interests include volunteering at church, watching professional wrestling, listening to the Oak Ridge Boys, playing the tuba, and watching the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah, Cowboys. All right, next we have Mark Jackson, and Mark is the Director of Production Services at the Richard Stockton College of New Jersey. And that college is a four-year public liberal arts college located on 2,000 acres within the Pinelands National Reserve in southern New Jersey. He joined the college in 2000 as Director of Media Services and Distance Education with responsibility for classroom support, campus-wide video distribution system, media collection, and distance education. In 2008, he was charged with supporting events on campus, producing high-end media promoting the college, and managing the College Educational Access Channel. Mark earned his MFA at University of Michigan and has over 26 years experience in higher education media support and production and has worked at the University of Michigan, University of North Texas Health Science Center, and now with the Richard Stockton College of New Jersey. Aaron Scott. Aaron Scott currently serves as a Multimedia Services Manager of Academic Computing Resources for Stanford University Libraries. She creates and designs content for the department as well as teaches a class on basic multimedia use, hardware and software, and provides consultations for classes and professors on using Adobe and Apple software products. She has worked previously at Yale University, attended St. Mary's College in Notre Dame, Indiana, and is currently an active volunteer member of ResNet Inc. as well as CCUMC. Erin's personal interests include hiking, singing, crocheting, and blogging copiously about her dog Parker. And Lindley Shedd is the Media Services Coordinator at the University of Alabama Libraries. She manages the Sanford Media Center, a unit dedicated to supporting student multimedia production. Responsibilities include administration of the Sanford Media Center, working with teaching faculty who are interested in planning course projects that utilize multimedia tools in their creation or delivery, and teaching a multitude of multimedia software, including video production, audio production, and web and graphic design. Within CCUMC, Lindley serves as the editor of The Leader and also serves as a member of the research committee. Lindley received her MIS in the Information Sciences from Indiana University School of Library and Information Science in 2008, and this is her third consecutive CCUMC presentation. So we have a fabulous panel here for us all, and uh, we're going to get started. So I want to take a minute just to uh, talk about what I was hoping that this presentation would be. And um, one of the things I think a lot of times we do is we come to these sessions, and then we get asked the details. Well, what model are you using, or what version of X, Y, and Z are you using? So when I put this group together, I wanted it to be very specific. If you've gotten a chance to look at our 16 pages of supplemental documentation, so we're not going to be using the projector today. There is no formal PowerPoint. This is a discussion among us and among you all. But we have listed every model of every piece of equipment that we have um, in our respective spaces. Uh, the other thing that kind of changed as we went forward is I don't do production work as far as my unit producing content. But as we started talking about what our panelists have in their spaces, we also added production equipment. Um, so for example, Mark's area is doing a lot of internal production. They have some high-end equipment that they don't circulate to their users. So we ended up splitting things out into the equipment we circulate to our faculty, staff, and students, 
And then there's also a series of documentation about what our internal production equipment items are. Again, with all the model specifications and things like that listed. Um, I also wanted to say that one thing that this panel is not going to cover is equipment installed in classrooms. We're really talking about things like video cameras to projectors that we circulate to our campus users. And so I just want to make sure that everyone understands kind of our parameters of our conversation. So what we're going to do is we're each going to take about five minutes to introduce our spaces, how we're, uh, we're all located in the libraries, but just from our bios, you see that we do very different things. Our campuses are very different sizes. So we're each going to take about five minutes to kind of give you an idea of what each of our unit's major uh, responsibilities are and our, our uh, areas of support. And then what I really want this to be is a conversation. Uh, we want you to be able to ask us anything about our equipment, our budgets, our um, why we choose what we choose. I also do have a list of conversation topics that if we do start to, you know, nobody has questions, I will send us down a new path. But I really think with a group this big, we can just talk about what we're interested in. Uh, for the sake of time to be sure that we do cover a lot of topics, if we get into a back and forth um, and we've been on a topic for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes, we may move on to redirect just so that we get some uh, chance to talk about other things. But really, this is kind of controlled chaos is my plan here. So um, with that, I'll go ahead and start with a little bit about my space. Um, I am at the University of Alabama main campus in Tuscaloosa. I am a member of the uh, Library Technology Division. And we're a campus of 33,000 students. So we're a pretty big campus. As um, Pat said, I manage a student production space meaning I am supporting students in video assignments, audio assignments, somebody wants to learn Photoshop to do flyers for student organizations, etc. I answer to an associate dean of library technology who answers to the dean of libraries, who answers to the provost. So I'm within the division of academic affairs. Um, I don't answer through any of the traditional IT departments or anything like that. The other thing that I wanted to take a minute to say is that my unit is very focused, but we do also have a central um, center for instructional technology. So when I talk about we don't do internal media production, the media services division of central instructional technology does that kind of thing. The classroom support is handled by the center for instructional technology, which answers to someone entirely different than anyone that I have in my answering line except at the end, we're all in academic affairs and answer to the provost. So um, we're a very, very focused space. We see about 14,000 students a year in a space with 11 computers in one studio. We are open about 96 hours a week, and I have four full-time staffers. So we're a very, very active little space, um, supporting everything that the students come in asking about. We have about 65 pieces of equipment, and, and in the documentation we talk about kits. One of the things that's a little bit different amongst all of us is um, do you put barcodes on every cord and cable and piece? In my case, we send out what we call kits, meaning the power cord, uh, the battery, the device, the SD card, if it has an SD card, and that whole uh, package just has one barcode that we're assigning to their student account. So that differs a little bit among us, so we're trying to help you all understand how we talk about our stuff. So when I say 65, I mean audio packages and video cameras, green screen, what have you. The other thing that I do a lot of is teaching. I am teaching 30 sections in, for 15 professors in eight divisions of our institution this semester, in English, in dance, in Spanish, so a lot of what my area is doing is circulating the equipment, supporting the students in creating whatever objects they've been assigned to create, teaching them the software in order to do it, um, and then helping them all the way through their production process in any of the areas that we support. And while that is nowhere close to five minutes, that's what I wanted to say about my space. Hi everyone, I'm Erin from Stanford University. Um, 
like I do very very similar work to what Lindley does. Um, probably about a third of my time goes to teaching classes to students. Um, during we're on a trimester system, and during the fall quarter, we call them quarters, but we're on trimesters. I don't understand it either. Um, during the fall quarter, I teach to the RCCs, which are the students who go out and help students with their computer problems. They're the ones that run the student networks in the residences um, and things like that. And then in the winter quarter, the RCCs teach that in turn to their freshmen and transfers, while I simultaneously offer a, um, an advanced section of the same class. And then during the spring quarter, we wait for the seniors to freak out because suddenly everything is due and oh no, they don't have things done. Um, so that's, that's about a third of my time is, is education and outreach and teaching. Another third of my time is probably spent doing um, you know, in-house production stuff. I'm currently working on a documentary for the new student orientation which just happened a couple of weeks ago. And then the last third of my time is spent doing you know, departmental things, designing you know, random little posters and stuff like that. Um, as far as budget goes, we have an annual budget of about $9,000 right now and I'm currently convincing my boss and her boss that we need to uh, increase it quite substantially. Um, it was actually really exciting to get all the information from my colleagues at the table with me because then I can go to them and say, look, this is what other schools are doing and they clearly have a budget and they clearly you know, have this, um, these amazing sets of equipment, we need to step it up. Um, so that, you know, just a little plug for y'all there that you can, you can go to your administrators and say, look, other people are doing this too and it's really cool. Um, as far as the support model goes, we, it's a little bit patchy right now, but that's something that we're working on is, is creating a better support model. Students who want help come to, it's called the tech desk. There's a, there's a multimedia lab right in front of it. It houses about 16 computers with um, currently Final Cut 7 and um, Adobe CS5. We'll be upgrading to other software here in a couple of months. Is this not loud enough? Do I need to sit closer? I can do that. I can do that. Oh, there we go. Um, and we don't offer a whole lot in terms of hardware support for those students. We also do not have a studio. Um, we are, however, going to be moving into a new building in a couple of years because the one we're in is technically not earthquake safe, and I hear that's an issue in San Francisco. Hmm. Um, so at that point, I am, I'm lobbying for a studio space for our students to use because we don't really have on anything else like that on campus. Uh, we serve the entire student population. Faculty and staff can also use our resources as long as you have a, an active and valid Stanford ID. We'll check it out to you. Um, we do have a couple of specialty labs on campus, but the only students who can access those are students in that program or department or if they're taking a class. So the journalism department and the film studies department, for example, have advanced setups like ours, but they're not available to the general public. And so we really focus on getting stuff out to the, to the general student population, particularly the undergrads. Um, as far as offerings, you know, like I said, we don't really offer a whole lot of hardware support at this time. There is the Stanford Storytelling Project, which I can refer students to for additional help with their hardware because um, they, they get in some, some really nice big names. They're actually pulling in both Ira Glass and Jed Abumrad this year to come in and do some talks for the, story, the Storytelling Project. So we can refer students to them as well as an additional resource on campus, which is really cool. Um, as far as what we're doing to actually check equipment out, we use the library software. Um, it's called Courseworks, not Courseworks, I'm sorry, Workflows. We use Workflows in that and um, our kits are individually barcoded every single item from the SD card to the USB cord to the power cord to the power brick. Everything has a barcode and Workflows supports that. I know a lot of circulation management software doesn't. Um, if you can figure out a way to make it do it, I really, really like it because what our policy is, is if, if all the barcodes aren't there, it doesn't get checked in. It really places the onus on the student to make sure all of their bits and pieces are there because otherwise they start getting hit with overdue fees. And it's not an overdue fee for a USB cord, it's an overdue fee for the entire kit. Um, we usually charge about $15 a day for overdue fees. Um, could be worse, at Yale it was $35 a day. Um, so ours is, ours is tremendous. Ours is $20 an hour. Wow, can I move to that? <laughs> when they're afraid, they bring it back. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. Go ahead. Um, so that's just about all I have, which is not five minutes either, but I will pass it on to the next. Okay. Uh, my name is Adam Beck, and I'm um, on a campus that called Missouri State University, and we are a campus of 21,059 students this fall. 
Um, um, we are, um, I'm part of, I'm the equipment lending supervisor for a unit within the Faculty Center for Teaching and Learning called the Classroom Instructional Technologies. And uh, we have been around, not as part of that, you know, we used to be a center um, department. Um, we've been around since 1968. Um, <laughs> um, we started really heavily doing delivery. Uh, there was a need for that. And we started in a actual uh, classroom building there on campus and that within the education wing and we have evolved into where we're now in, located in the library. Um, we are not part of the library. The faculty center is not considered part of the library. Um, we, are, we just reside there because um, they really don't know where to put us, uh, that we, where we would fit in elsewhere on campus. Um, we, do have, um, we do have a small production studio within the faculty center that, that people can, teachers can come in and record things. Um, to use within their classes when they're going to be gone. Um, within my area, we have um, uh, about nine student assistants um, plus two uh, full-time repair technicians that repair stuff. Um, users for us is more um, students, faculty, and staff, but also emeritus faculty and staff. We allow them to come in and check out equipment. And so, as you can imagine, that's um, depending on what they're trying to do is quite challenging sometimes. Um, we have um, about roughly between 500 and 700 pieces of circulating equipment that could be circulated. Um, not all of it gets checked out. Um, if you can imagine, um, for instance, some of that stuff would be considered like um, lenses for various projectors. Um, not all those lenses get checked out at once. Um, and so we have that where um, we have Within our within, within classroom instructional technologies, there's four of us full time. Um, we uh, we're open 40 hours a week, um, Monday through Friday, from eight to five. Um, although we're going to probably here eventually start doing um, start back up with evening hours. Um, there's a big push on that on campus right now to have that availability for um, teachers. Um, we. Uh, we get all of our funding from uh, the provost office, so it's been, a, it's been a set amount per year that has just been allocated from them. Uh, we report to, um, to, a pro, to the provost there at Missouri State. Um, and so um, we've, uh, um, yeah, we've been delivering equipment and meeting the needs of, of the people. And uh, we're different from computer services, so computer services is a lot of the, all the computer things. One of the things that we have found that's really interesting on our campus is within the buildings there is a, um, what they call a distributed user support specialist. And so that person takes care of all the computer stuff while it allows us the CIT to take care of all the technology size for like the projectors and the rest of the stuff that's in the classrooms, so. Mark Jackson, I'm with uh, Richard Stockton College, New Jersey. It's in uh, South Jersey, about uh, 12 miles from Atlantic City and about the same distance to the shore. Um, been there about 12 years. When we first got there, uh, we checked out and circulated all of the equipment, all the AV equipment to students, faculty, and staff, um, which included uh, camcorders, light kits, audio kits, projectors, uh, audio cassette recorders, CD players, a lot of different equipment. Um, We've got a, a new president, a new vision, and uh, made some changes and uh, charged us with um, supporting events on campus and not just the microphones in the rooms but then also uh, projection of all events uh, graduation we now have two huge projectors that we simulcast um, any major speaker comes on campus we project that um, so there's a, a change in what we were doing we we're also supporting at that time all the classrooms and uh, changing those over from pulling the, the TVs out of the corner of the room, putting in projectors, uh, computers, document cameras and such, converting those over to uh, electronic classrooms. So we had a lot of uh, responsibilities. The uh, president came in and wanted us to do a lot of high-end video production for the campus in-house. They were spending a lot of money sending all that stuff out and so charged us with doing that. About the same time, the uh, communications program, uh, who was the largest user 
of all of our AV equipment decided that they wanted to have more control over the equipment and so we transferred all of that circulating of the uh, that AV equipment over to the communications program. Uh, prior to that, I had secured funding to build a media lab and then upgrade a small TV studio which was across the hall. So the media lab, the TV studio, and all the equipment was transferred over to the communications program to manage that. In return, uh, we identified that there were still needs by uh, students working on projects, creating video projects for their, uh, especially uh, final projects in their classrooms. Uh, and so we were able to uh, replace some of that equipment that would be then circulated to non-communications program students as well as faculty and staff. And that's when we purchased our uh, equipment that we circulate now. Uh, we purchased uh, four iMacs that allowed them to do editing on iMovie. And we also in, uh, installed Final Cut Express on those machines. Um, we purchased um, some higher end camcorders strictly because we were now doing more and more production work trying to upgrade our own production equipment and uh, my idea was to have the circulating equipment capable of providing background or backup if we had problems with some of our cameras. So instead of the um, $100, $200 camcorders, we were paying a little bit more for those because they had audio out and other things that we needed for our production. So we had a little bit higher end stuff. Um, we now circulate uh, about 26 pieces of equipment, uh, camcorders, dig digital audio recorders. Um, we still circulate uh, some uh, video projectors, portable video projectors, and um, screens. We have found that over the years that student circulation has gone down drastically, but faculty circulation has increased. Um, and so uh, instead of replacing our equipment now with new uh, tapeless recorders, uh, we're going to be phasing out, at least from our aspect, all circulating equipment through attrition. So once it dies, it's not going to be replaced because currently most of our users are faculty. Um, we still manage a, a TV studio. Um, I've got a staff of eight, and we produce uh, a lot of high-end video for the college, promotional, uh, recruitment type um, video. We also support all the events on campus. And uh, so um, different from everybody else on, on the panel here, we are moving out of the circulating equipment to the students. <coughs> Um, when we did circulate it, we then provided all the training on how to use the equipment and do all the maintenance ourselves. Um, I mentioned we were 12 miles from uh, the shore, so a lot of our equipment came back with sand in the cases. <laughs> um, so we had a, a lot of repairs and uh, such because everybody wanted to shoot their videos out on the, on the sand in the water and, and such. Um, so we do not uh, circulate to uh, the communications students, but we do a small number of students working on projects. Uh, our student body is about 8,000 students, so we're not a huge school. Um, and it seems that um, most of our students have an iPhone or some other camera that can, or a phone that can capture video sufficient for their projects they do in, in class. Thank you all. Um, so as you can see, we're all a little bit different. We have s a smaller institution up through the larger. Um, our purposes are all a little bit different. So what we're going to do, and, and I want to say also, because we're trying to record this and this is a conversation-based group here today, uh, Pat is going to be walking around with one of the microphones to try to get your questions recorded. And I realize it's going to put a little stall in between our interaction. But I really do think that having the questions and our answers recorded is really going to work for this group. Um, so please try to work with Pat as she runs around the room today. Uh, and with that, we'll open up for questions. Um, the only thing I'll say that I didn't specify is that I only support students. We don't circulate anything to faculty. We don't support, circulate anything to staff. 
So that's another little bit of a difference between what a lot of us are doing. Um, so any questions to start or should, all right. I will try to walk very quickly and if I can't reach you, I will repeat your question. Erin, um, <laughs> can you just, um, I didn't catch when you were talking about how you approach missing USB cords and et cetera and equipment. Uh, you said something that everything wasn't in the kit that they were still uh, found, that the equipment was overdue. You were right. talking about so, workflow. Each, yeah. each piece in a kit has a barcode? Yes, each piece in a kit is barcoded. We have um, little tags that fit onto them and they're clasped between two pieces of plastic with a barcode on it. If a student comes back and the kit is not complete, if the USB cord is missing, if the SD card is missing, the student then, the item does not get checked in and the student can go back to their room and they can find it or they can immediately claim that it was lost. If it's lost, then what we do is we mark that in the system and the replacement cost is automatically charged to their student account at the library. It doesn't go to their bursar account, it goes to their student account at the library. Um, they're not implicitly tied together. They can be, but a lot of students don't do that. Um, so if they claim it is lost, it immediately is billed. We have a huge stack of USB cords that just live in a drawer and when we check something out as a kit, what it does is that workflows, which is the name of the software, pops up a list and says you need to pull out an SD card, you need to pull out a USB cord. So if someone loses a USB cord, it's not really the end of the world from our perspective because we have a box of 200 more in the desk. So we assemble kits at the desk, we disassemble them at the desk, and it's, it's a model that's working really well for us because it means that you know we've got, like I said, like 200 USB cords. Um, when we get into issues of power cords, those are a little bit trickier to deal with because, you know, in the case of like a video camera, more often than not, you're going to need a power cord at some point. Um, what we try and do is when we do purchasing, we'll purchase one extra of things like that. Um, you know, same thing with microphones, we'll purchase extra um, XLR cables and things like that so that we have them on hand and we just, again, we just pre-barcode them, put them in the bucket, and then the students know that those need to be grabbed. Um, Anybody else? Your workflows differ from that? We use workflows also, and we uh, barcode just the camcorder. We do not barcode individual cables. We just do it as a kit. And then when it comes back in, there is still a uh, form they have to fill out. When we check it out to a student, we, they have to have a faculty sponsor. And so they'll have a, a place for the faculty to sign. And uh, then the kit gets signed out to them, barcode on the camcorder. And then when it comes back in, one of the techs will inventory the kit and make sure everything is there. If it's not, then it gets charged to their uh, library account because we use workflows also. Adam? Yeah, we, um, we actually <laughs> check stuff out. We actually looked at systems on the market for a checkout and didn't find anything that we really liked that would fit what we wanted it to do. And so we had a computer programmer on staff that wrote um, entire, an entire program that was designed just for us um, to fit our needs. And so we, we do stuff like Richard does. We, we don't really barcode all the individual items. Um, we make note of them on the checkout form, but we don't, we don't barcode every individual item, just the major stuff, and then check it all back in when they bring it back. And I would say the only difference to what we do is we have a lot of things that are optional. We have a lot of students who weren't using the you know, composite cables or what have you, but then they were still damaging, damaging them because they would shut the cases on them and squash the connectors. So then they were getting mad that they were getting charged for something they never used but they still broke. So in our case, we have the things that we consider necessary, meaning power. So if it's powered through USB, we have a new Yeti microphone, you have to have the USB you know, to connect. That goes out with the USB, but nothing else does unless they ask for it. So we've really stripped down our kits to what they need and then have uh, our, our check sheets are actually an example of one of the documents. There's a very detailed check sheet that every time any piece of equipment goes out, we go through the check sheet. And every time it comes back, we go through the check sheet. And again, the student has to sign saying either it came back as it went out, meaning nothing was missing, broken, or damaged, or it didn't come back as it went out. And the student that turns in the equipment is not allowed to leave until that check sheet is complete. So we have a check sheet system. We are using the library catalog system, which is Voyager in our world, uh, in order to attach it to their account. 
And thank goodness it does go to the bursar and it's not my problem. <laughs> so, yeah. Question in the back. Oh, I was going to add to that. We also do strip down kits. The other thing to note is that we do just check out pieces of things. So if a student just wants to borrow a USB cord, we will let them check out just a USB cord. We don't do that with SD cards um, just because they tend to be a little bit more on the expensive side and they're very, very small. Um, but we do a lot of that where you know you can you can check out just an XLR cable. You can check out just a power cord that goes to you know a standard um, projector or things like that. You don't have to necessarily check out the entire kit. So we have lots of little extra pieces in <coughs> drawers with labels on them. And Lindley and Aaron, can you just speak up a little bit when you reply? Sure. Uh, this question is directed to Mark. Mark, uh, when you were charged to do the campus events at your institution, were you given additional resources, staffing, or an equipment budget to, to, to focus on the events? Um, when we made that change, we no longer supported the classrooms at that time. Uh, we also moved the support of the lab and also the studio into another area. So when that happened, we actually lost staff because the staff went with the uh, space. Um, since then, uh, I have uh, increased my staff by three uh, to do handle the, the load that we have. Um, the budget issue is I have a uh, annual maintenance and operational budget that is given to me. We go through a process every year of uh, submitting a budget and then the administration looks at it and cuts our budget, you know, two, three percent. Um, we do have an option of putting in for what we call capital equipment. And so every year I put in for a few thousand dollars uh, for capital equipment. Uh, over the years I've been fairly uh, successful in getting equipment. Um, we now operate um, our production equipment. We have two Sony 335 XD cams. We have uh, four uh, Sony EX3 cameras and uh, some pretty good audio equipment that we've been able to accumulate. But it is a, a annual request and it takes a lot of um, justification to do that. And I think at this point we've touched on pretty much everybody's budget but mine. And I'm much like Mark, I have no money. I, I have to go forward and say here's what I would like. I have no operating budget whatsoever. Uh, my associate dean of library technology controls the budget for all departments that answer to him. So I, every uh, May, put in a request for what I want to do for the year that starts October 1. Uh, but I have a very active unit. Uh, the justification hasn't been hard for me. So I've spent about $20,000 a year every year I've been where I am doing different tasks. We have upgraded our studio. We've expanded our equipment. Um, we have gotten rid of a lot of old equipment. So, so far, things have worked out well for me, but I don't actually have any budget that I control. So. Questions? I'm very interested in uh, hearing that you're not supporting faculty or not going to support fa faculty and just students. Is there any other place that supports faculty? Because faculty support and student support Faculty, we have more equipment requests from faculty who need projectors to go to conferences, who check out laptops, who use the digital audio recorders to record their presentations for integrity, or the Revo Labs uh, mics to use, uh, again, to record, and or the DATs to do live interviews and things like that. And we have a lot of education faculty who go out in the schools and need those camcorders, who need those, that equipment. So we're just wondering, how do you support faculty and their needs, or, expect, or do you expect their departments just to handle their needs? Well, that's the one reason I tried to explain a little bit of how I'm structured and that we have this whole other group that's over there. The other group that's over there is faculty support. The reason I only support students is because uh, my space was created based on gift money with parameters that listed this space is for students. The other thing is, is honestly, I'm so busy that I couldn't really successfully support both unless my space had more staff, more space. Again, 11 computers, 33,000 students, and we see more than 14,000 students a year. So on the faculty side, what I do as far as supporting faculty 
is I do workshops on how to integrate tech, uh, media, in my case media, into their assignments and uh, classrooms. But our Blackboard support system, the honest goodness truth is our students have better access to equipment than our faculty do. Uh, that, that's just the truth. Some departments have gone, English has a pool of equipment for their faculty, um, et cetera, et cetera, and around little pockets here and there. Um, but as far as going in, picking up a camcorder, um, most faculty don't have access to that at my institution right now, which we, is very awkward. <laughs> sorry. Oh, we actually do support faculty and, and students. We, um, we have a lot of faculty, much like like what you've described, that are, are needing projectors for conferences and um, departments have zero money and so um, they would much rather send their faculty members to come over to us and check stuff out. Um, what is interesting is I think for faculty is that we have um, a broad range of faculty members. Faculty that have been on there for 33 years um, on one extreme and then the other extreme is faculty that are just coming on board and how do you mix, how do you balance the types of equipment that meets both both sets of faculty members. Um, we have a lot of students that come in and check out equipment from us for their fraternities and sororities and student organizations. Um, part of that is what I always like to, I joke around with them and it's really is the truth that they come in expecting us to be their source for um, their big concert that they're going to have and, and we're not set up for to check out stuff for their concerts so we don't have lighting systems to check out and we don't have monitors to set out or subwoofers or anything like that. So we have to tell them we're not set up for, for, a, rock, for a rock concert for you guys to bring your, your local band in but um, we'll just do what we can and, and so we do that and so we, um, um, we, we do it all things. There is a, a form attached I think in the thing you'll see um, that requires student organizations, students to actually get permission from their um, authorized faculty and staff representative, um, which every organization on campus has one, um, that the Office of Student Engagement runs, and they have to get permission, have it, have it get signed by that faculty member, so it kind of protects the students in the event something would happen to their equipment or whatever, so we can go back, have a way to go back and recollect the, the amount lost. Okay. Well, I was going to say, um, most of our equipment is checked out to faculty, very few of it is uh, circulated to students. Um, we find that most of the faculty that come in that request a small projector and a screen are going out to a community organization, which might not have those facilities, but most of our other faculty, when they present, it's in a place like this where there is uh, uh, AV support. Um, uh, right now, uh, we usually check out our equipment for five days, and then it can be renewed um, several times. We make exceptions with faculty where they can check it out for a longer period of time. And our camcorders are out constantly and they're usually checked out for the full semester to faculty. We also have a institute for faculty development that has a few pieces of equipment and some of the other schools um, have a small projector that they take out. Since Mark mentioned loan times, I will just go down and kind of give an idea. Ours are 72 hours. Um, renewals cannot be done online because we'll have reservation system so students can reserve weeks ahead etc so um, you have it 72 hours and then if you bring it back and it's available there's not a reservation behind it you could carry it back out the door but you can't have rolling reservations to where it's just blocked off yeah we do not do reservations it is a pure walk-up service first come first serve um, the students are allowed to have the equipment for about 24 hours it's, it's actually uh, has to be returned by 5 p.m. the following day. So if they check it out at 8 a.m. on Monday, it's due 5 p.m. on Tuesday. Um, the, we do not do renewals, but if you bring it back in, check it back in, and then wait an hour, if nobody else has come in that one hour window, you can check it back out again. Um, this is actually controlled through the software, so we don't have to sit there and remember that, um, we, we actually have this guy we call iPad guy. I don't actually know his name, but he comes in <laughs> and he compulsively checks out an iPad and he will bring the iPad back every day at five o'clock and he will wait for an hour and then check the iPad back out. Um, so we, we do have people who just, who actually we have one guy, it's, it's iPad guy, um, who sits there and waits for the iPad to become available. But um, you know, otherwise most students either will hang out for an hour or they'll just you know, come back the next day if they wanna check it back out again. 
we're different. We just we offer a seven day checkout to students, um, but we do allow faculty members to to check things out for the semester. Um, things like uh, laptops could be checked out by faculty members for the semester, and that way they don't have to keep coming back and, and doing stuff like that. So, other questions. We'll try to be quick because we don't actually have all that much time left. So. Hi. Um, so you guys, some of you said that you had five or seven day checkouts and I'm just wondering how you have enough equipment to circulate to be able to check out for that long a period of time. Is it that you just don't have a lot of people requesting equipment or that you have a huge inventory? Uh, for us, we have a, a pretty decent sized inventory. Um, a lot of it, what happens to be is some will have some teachers who assign projects to their particular class and they're responsible for those class members to come and check out their equipment and do the, do the project and then return it back to us. And I'm sure we've all have had this happen before. Not everybody checks those things out at one time. And some of them will wait till the last minute. Some of, them, some of the students are, having, are advantageous and get done early. So it just, it's, stagger, it's staggered. But we found usually a seven days is more than adequate enough time to get stuff done um, in the time frame that they need to get done. We don't have a whole lot of inventory, but uh, we don't, uh, currently we do not have a lot of students that come in and request. So when we extend the checkout to faculty, it's with the stipulation that if somebody comes in and needs it, we can call them and then come and retrieve the equipment and check it out. So we don't have a whole lot of equipment, and most of the students that come in to borrow it and check out the equipment have it for a day or two, and the, the five day is not a, an issue. Someone had mentioned support for evening hours. Can each of you speak to that? Because we're kind of struggling with how to do it. I mean, we, how to have it. There's a system set up, and nobody likes the system. We want to change it, but we don't have any options. So my space is open until midnight most nights. I have a full-time exempt staff member who do, will do the same things that I will. He teaches at 8 o'clock at night. He does one hour consultations on Photoshop at 10 p.m. if that's what a student wants. Um, our service desk, I just added a fourth staff member who's 80% responsible for sitting on our service desk. Uh, and they work um, an 11 to seven kind of thing in the middle of our day. So our early evening, we have two full-time staff members. Um, and then again, we have coverage up through the night. The only time we are ever student run is Saturday. and. Uh, we do some incredibly extensive student training. Our students take proficiency exams on all of our software. So I have no problem. I mean, our students have security codes and keys to our space and, and I have a great student staff as well. But we actually have a staff member who works until midnight. Um, we have three full-time staff members that support various parts of our department. Um, we actually just hired a new service desk manager and that will be her entire job is just to man the service desk. She'll su provide basic support as you know, a little bit less than I do. I tend to do more of the consultation type things and the teaching, whereas she'll do on the spot training. Um, so there's two of us and then um, there the, we have student staff and the students come in and we are open from 8 a.m. to midnight most days, the exception being um, Saturday and Sunday, we have a little bit different hours. We open later on Saturday and Sunday, but stay open pretty late on Saturday. Um, as far as the students getting help one-on-one, -on -one, um, unfortunately, all of our seniors um, who were fantastic graduated last year. Half of our staff was seniors who had you know this, this incredible wealth of knowledge with um, hardware and software, and so we're actually in the process of retraining all of our new hires to get them back up to speed so that we can provide better student support than just me. Um, because like I, said, like I said, we just hired the new service desk manager. She starts in two weeks. Um, and she doesn't, you know, she doesn't know everything about media. And so we're, it is a building process for us. Um, but um, if I can jump institutions for a moment, previously when I was working at Yale, we did very similar things where the, where the students you know had proficiency exams and the students went through an entire semester of training with me. It was required. Um, and you know, it was a lot of time on our part, but it was worth it in the fact that I could leave the office at 5 p.m. and know that my students would provide support 
perhaps not quite at the same exact level that I can provide, but very, very close, and you can get people at least started on projects knowing that they're not going to be completely lost, so that they'll open up iMovie and go, what is this? Instead, it's, oh, hey, I can do this. Um, so you know, there's a lot of training involved. We used to do, um, we used to have night people, um, but we, um, when we became a unit, um, we were only assigned so many student hours, and so evening services kind of got cut by the wayside. Um, and we also found that there just wasn't that many phone calls coming in at night uh, for what we did in terms of helping out in the classroom. So, um, however, um, we are getting ready to um, reinstall that and put some night support in. Um, there's a big push on campus to have that from various departments so that in the event that a projector breaks down for a night class, we're able to go out and fix that right away. So um, how we go about doing that and staffing that will be a, a, a topic still to figure out. But um, we generally don't open on the weekends. We're only open Monday through Friday. Um, and that's just because, again, we're not part of the library, so the library can open on, on the weekends, but we just won't, and so it works well. We're open from 8 in the morning till 10 at night, Monday through Thursday, and then 8 to 5 on Friday. Um, we are not open on the weekend, with the exception as if there's an event or something that's going on on campus, then we have a flexible shift mm -hmm. that uh, we're able to move um, staff around. I, I was just uh, wondering if you guys could talk about, um, in terms of replacement costs, uh, if you guys do ACV or RCV when you guys actually charge out. So do you guys depreciate the value of the equipment? Because we've been in a situation before where we've done that and it really didn't work out well. So I just kind of wanted to hear you guys talk about that. Uh, we use um, we use items till they break, and then we put it in the repair shop, and if we can get parts for it, great. Um, if not, then, then we just have to go out and buy a replacement one for it. Um, we don't like as far as like replacement costs per se we um uh, if a student would lose a piece of equipment we'll charge them basically what the replacement costs are depending on what we can find online for that um if it's an item no longer made we just we guess about what it would be like in terms of like when we when it was first bought compared to what it would be like now and that's kind of a general a general thing for that um um uh, as for, um, and so, replacement costs is part of just part of our budget. And, and as we as things break and we can't get parts for it, then we just we have to go and replace it based on the need. We look at a general cost. Let's take a digital audio recorder. In my system, a digital audio recorder has a replacement value assigned to it that generally is going to be an average cost to, you know, we're not gonna charge students more than what we're gonna pay to replace it. But generally we're doing a direct replacement cost-ish. Um, and then, you know, let's say that we've decided to go up in quality or we've decided to go up in, in what we're providing. We're gonna charge them for whatever that original value was that we'd assigned to that other object and we're gonna pay the difference to make that increase in quality or size or whatever. Um, but we're doing pretty much a direct replacement cost. We are too. I mean, the way I explained it to more than one student who was complaining about it is that, well, you lost something and now I have to replace it and I can't buy one at a depreciated cost. I have to pay full dollar value and how yeah. is that fair to me when you were the one that lost it? Um, because of the way that uh, uh, workflows works is that we don't actually, we have to do things in tiers. So things are not $800, $900, $1,000. It's um, you know a $50 price point, a $100 price point, a $500 price point, and a $1,000 price point. So we round whatever the nearest is. Um, in most cases, we have very few things that are worth $1,000, and they're not actually worth $1,000. So what we'll do is that if that item is lost, we'll work with the student and actually bring the cost down um, in their bill. We'll you know s manually submit something to the to the accounts office and say, you know, okay, it's a thousand dollars would you drop 200 off because it was an 800 hundred dollar camera not a thousand dollars so we do when that happens it doesn't happen actually that often for the big ticket items it tends to be more like usb cords and vga adapters um so for those you know you can match that pretty closely to things like 50 dollars. but if it's if it's significantly less than our tiered pricing then we will you know chop that down for them because it isn't really that fair to charge them 200 dollars extra for something we do a straight replacement cost uh, a faculty member, if they lose a power cord to a camcorder, 
we tell them this is how much it would cost us to, re to replace that. If they want to replace it themselves, then that's fine. We'll take that in. Um, one thing, we, we have to purchase all of our equipment off an approved state vendor list, and a lot of the um, vendors uh, choose not to register with the state of New Jersey, and so we have very limited, uh, uh, in some cases, very limited access to some of the bigger suppliers. Sorry, related question to that. Um, I'm curious, something we deal with in terms of fines or replacement costs, um, we can put the student costs on their student account, but when it's a faculty member, we have to go through a whole different process. And I'm curious how you handle that. Um, usually the, the things that get lost or misplaced or destroyed with our equipment are power cords, USB cables, um, firewire cables and stuff like that. And we either tell them that we can charge their department or they can replace it on their own. Um, sometimes when they say, well, how much does it cost? Um, we'll look it up. We can buy it for, let's say a power cord, we can buy it for 75 bucks. But if you go on Amazon and you can purchase it on Amazon for $12, that's fine. And so we give that option to them. So because our system is tied into the library account, it's automatically put on their library account. And the way the library accounts work is that um, if you accrue more than $50 in fines, your privileges are stopped. You cannot check out anything at any of our libraries. And so it's effectively self-policing. Um, you know, you lose a camera, well, that's definitely more than $50, and they're not going to be checking anything out. Um, at that point, it's between them, their department, and the library accounts office to figure out who's going to pay it. Um, so then I, my hands are clean at that point, and I'm very happy. <laughs> and uh, over here. Um, do you insure any of your equipment specifically for if it gets stolen rather than lost? No, we actually had a student who police report on file everything and it still went to his student account. Um, we've looked into insurance and actually Aaron and I were talking about this earlier. Um, every policy we've been able to find says you cannot use it for groups. It's, it's very individual. Um, so if you look at what Amazon offers for some of their more expensive or what B&H offers, um, and B&H is a contract vendor for me, so that's one of my examples. Their fine print actually says, and you cannot use this for an apartment building or a business or anything like that. So, right, we we have been buying those plans occasionally because the B&H rep at the time seemed to think that that you know we could somehow get around that. I'm not sure if that's actually true or not, um, but I mean we just we don't really have a whole lot of insurance. Um, one of the things I actually highly encourage you to do is look at getting private insurance from the student perspective. Um, again, jumping institutions. I just changed institutions in July, by the way. Um, so a lot of my experience is actually coming from Yale. Um, Yale has a program called HFNC. It's an insurance company, and it's vetted through the Office of Risk Management. And students can buy a personal insurance plan um, for relatively cheaply. I think the basic one is about $75. The next tier is 85. Deductibles are $100 and then $50, respectively. So if you can get your Office of Risk Management to seriously look into the personal property insurance through something like HFNC. I know there are other companies out there. I highly recommend it. Um, you know, I've had students who have lost $1,000 cameras and, you know, that's $1,000 that has to go to their student account or their bursar account or their library account, and that's a lot of money. Um, and I know that there were students who were very, very happy to find out that there was a personal property insurance plan. Um, I mean, I'm currently looking at seeing and working with General Counsel and the Office of Risk Management at Stanford to see if we can get something like that in place because it was so useful. And you know, if, if you know, the, again, the company was H F and C. Um, so if you can somehow convince your Office of Risk Management to buy into that, that's great and it's a fantastic resource. And H F and C, I've worked with them before, and they are amazingly easy to work with. We have about ten minutes left. Doug in the back has had a question. Or is it just go to the bookstore? Because so, just curious if any of you have touched 
uh, clicker technology in your AV checkout areas? Bookstore. 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 Yeah, bookstore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I was curious if you uh, have a, uh, any type of software that you use for checking out your equipment. Say that again. Software, do you use software to I check out I think we're all equipment? using our library systems, pretty except much, except Adam. what Adam's home yeah, built. We, we, yeah, we, we, we looked at various ones online, and we had different demos, and we wanted one that would do reporting and, and different things, and we felt like just at the time, based on what the market was and what our needs were as an institution, we, we had a guy who, who was a, kind of a, he was a student, he was a computer, kind of a computer programmer person, and he, and he took a look at it and said, I can write a program that would fit, fit for, what we, for what this department needs. Five minutes left, so we're gonna keep up with some questions. Lindley, our system is very similar to your system by way of checking out. We use workflows as well. Um, our biggest problem is our reservation system is an Excel spreadsheet, and we use Max, and so it is so unstable it crashes every other day, and, and we've rebuilt it many times. I'm just curious if you have a reservation system that okay. you use that is more effective than that. No. Um, we have the, the library system to attach it to their account when they leave our space with it. We use a open source booking system called Meeting Room Booking System. And our rooms are our pieces of equipment. The challenge with that is, is that our staff have to go into our reservation system, so-and-so's late, so-and-so did actually get our equipment. And so in addition to marking in, attaching to their student account, we have to make sure that our booking matches our, our system. And so, Yes, it's very stable, it works very well, it's a web interface, all of us can access it from all of our computers, we don't have the issue of who's got it open and therefore it's read only and all that kind of stuff, but we still are doing two systems that are independent of one another, and the human er error element of that um, is a difficult challenge. Any other questions in the few minutes we have left? I had one thing to comment on that. I mean, we're, we are also using workflows, and that's why we don't do actual reservations, is because it's very hard to do that. Um, if you're using Voyager, there is a new module out that you can do reservations through it. It's complicated, and it's a pain in the butt, but at the end of the day, it might be worth it to uh, look at it. And if you're looking for open source alternatives, come see me afterwards, and I will tell you all about the fabulous Ruby and Rails project that Yale is working on. A couple of you mentioned using the software program uh, workflow. Can, yes. Can you talk about that and what it does for you? Workflows, the way we use it, it's part of the library circulation system. And so the library, that's how they check out all of their books and media. And uh, we just um, create files on there with the equipment, with a description. And so when it gets checked out, they just scan the barcode. They scan the student to the faculty's um, ID badge, and then it pulls their record up, and then we scan out the equipment with the barcode that way. And then it's managed through the library system. Prior to doing that, we used an access database and did everything by hand, and it was very cumbersome and uh, crashed a lot. And so when we talked to the library and they were willing to add our equipment to their list, uh, we were very happy about that. We have time for one more question. It's not really a question. I just wanted to add to your question back here about our reservation software. We use one of the vendors here at CCUMC Web Checkout to do our reservations. Um, it does reservations and um, when people come right up to the desk. So it's a really uh, great web program that they use. They can see what my staff can see what uh, checkouts they need to and reservations to prepare for and stuff. So because we deliver technology right to the classroom and we use the same product. So it's, it's pretty good. You should check them out. Web checkout. Yeah, they're one of the vendors here as well. Um, so I, I guess that's, that's our time. That is our time, and I'd like to thank all of these participants. 
and their contact information is in the proceedings, so I'm sure they'll be happy to answer any further questions that you might have and see them at the conference, check them out too. And a reminder from the UNLV people not to bring iPads and things on the tours to maybe uh, go stow those in your room and uh, have a great afternoon. See ya. Thank you all. Very Thank much. You. Good job. I appreciate it.